case anybody, in case anybody misses it, you can find it on the Portola Valley Town website in a day or so when it gets posted. Um, so welcome, welcome. It's great of you all to come. Um, and uh, this is this we've all, the midpoint, more or less, of our Portola Valley Nature and Science Committee speaker series. We've got a couple more flower talks coming up, uh, and one about um, galls um, in in uh, August that I hope everybody will enjoy. But tonight we are lucky to have. Leslie Field, Dr. Leslie Field here with us to talk about her work with the Arctic Ice Project. Um, I will let you, her explain a little bit more about their inspiring work, but I just wanted to say a couple of words about her. First and foremost, most important, is that she's a former member of the Portola Valley Nature and Science Committee. Um, feather in her cap for sure. Um, though it does perhaps pale a little bit to being the founder and CTO of the Arctic Ice Project and the good work she's done before that. Um, the Arctic Ice Project uh, focuses on ice restoration, Arctic ice restoration to slow climate change, hopefully with the goal of giving humanity 15 urgently needed years to complete the work of decarbonization and transition to sustainability. And she teaches at Stanford University. She teaches a very highly rated course there called uh, Engineering, Entrepreneurship, and Climate Change. Very appropriate for her since she has been an entrepreneur and inventor with more than 60 patents by now or more on the way, I'm sure. Um, she's uh, studied at uh, MIT and Berkeley. Um, she's got her MS, PhD, and has run a couple of successful engineering consulting companies. So she's got a broad, interesting background that she's bringing to this work. And I'm very curious to see um, how it's being applied. It's such, climate change is a big problem and it needs big solutions. And it just seems like Arctic Ice Project is thinking big. So I hand it off to you, eager to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you so much, Pamela. Uh, that was a very kind introduction. And uh, thanks to the entire Portola Valley Nature and Science Committee. You're right, I had fun for being on that for a few years when I when I could afford the time and it, it was a blast. And, and thanks to all of you in the audience for being here tonight. I really appreciate that. Um, I also wanna thank the town of Portola Valley because for many years I've had so much support in so many ways from my friends and neighbors here. I've received a lot of generous advice, vital financial support for this undertaking and from many people in town. Um, and that means that in my heart, I always think of this town as my co-founder. And uh, it's really, a, it's a lovely thing to, to have your, your work, your passion project uh, be welcomed in that way. So, as Pamela said, I am Leslie Field. I'm really happy to be speaking with you tonight. It's been a few years since I've spoken to the town like this, and it's a topic of great importance. Um, as Pamela said, just in case the intro didn't happen, because <laughs> I never know on one of these events, um, professionally, I've started some consulting companies. I've invented things that have had a big impacts in a couple of different industries, and I love teaching. So you've heard about my class. Uh, one thing you may not know is you're all welcome to audit any or all of the class sessions via Zoom, maybe even in person. I'm not sure how that's going to work out this fall, um, but contact me in late August if you'd like to be part of what I like to regard as a fact-based and hope-enhancing class. Um, in addition to my work, um, my husband Phil and I have been living in town for, gosh, is it nearly 30 years? Um, and we have two kids who are now young adults whom we love dearly. And I've got a number of fun hobbies that I try to make some time for here and there. Um, my work on climate started when the kids were just six and 10 years old, way back in 2006. And the work is inspired by having seen an inconvenient truth in a community showing that was sponsored by two other Portola Valley residents, Paul Holland and Linda Yates. They basically bought out the theater for all the parents of kids who were in the same classrooms with their kids. 
And I've always loved nature. I thought I was concerned and aware of what was going on environmentally. But this was the movie that woke me up to the fact that climate change was going to affect my own two kids in a really major way, right here in California, unless someone took action. And as I looked around, I didn't see enough action out there. So I put habitable planet on my to-do list, <laughs> seriously did. And I started passionately researching what on earth I might be able to do to make a positive difference in climate. If you'd like more of the personal story, uh, I gave a TEDx talk recently for the Menlo School, and uh, you can find the link to that still on my LinkedIn page. Um, if you have trouble finding it and you're interested, just let me know. Uh, back a few decades ago, of course, we thought we were heading into the next ice age. That was really the speculation. And if we hadn't added CO2 to our atmosphere, we may well have been sliding towards an ice age. But as scientists dug in, and I love this, that there's a fact behind things as you dig in in science and engineering. Um, as measurement techniques got better, as people got past the believing is seeing nature of human perception, which can explain a lot of what goes on around us, I think. And if you look long and hard enough at the data, you could see the truth was that the Earth's climate had changed over time, especially recently. And we unimaginably even several billion of us, it's still un unimaginable, had changed our atmosphere so that the Earth systems were undergoing major changes too. So one of the things that really caught my eye early on from the Gore movie, and uh, uh, things weren't visualized quite this well then, but uh, they certainly have been since, the best uh, video I've seen made uh, yet on what's happening with ice melt up in the Arctic. This is a NASA video. It goes back a few decades. There's some older videos that go back even farther that are even a little more stark, but this will give you the idea. So when you look at ice melt up in the Arctic, uh, sea ice over four years old is, is, you know, how much extent is there of this really bright stuff? Sea ice age is here. So they've taken the satellite imagery and translated into, is it young, fresh ice? Is it, is there no ice at all? This is open ocean. Young, fresh ice doesn't have much reflectivity. It's thin layer. It hasn't built up the imperfections that reflect nor the thickness. But as it ages, it gets more of those nooks and crannies. I look at my face and think about that. And it gets brighter and it gets thicker. And that's something we need because this has been the planetary heat shield uh, throughout all of human history, uh, helping to reflect a lot of incoming summer 24 hour a day sunlight from the Arctic. When you've got open ocean, you're absorbing most of that sunlight. When you've got thin ice, it doesn't last long. It reflects some. When you've got bright ice like this, it's reflecting a lot. These are a couple key areas that we've been studying. The Fram Strait, you can see there's a lot of ice export. And uh, the uh, historic nursery where the young ice grows up to be multi-year ice historically is the Beaufort Shire. We've worked here in Alaska at Point Barrow, now called Utkiagvik, back to its old name. And uh, so we've been right on in the action. But look at this. Now we're at 2009. It's an accelerating feedback loop. That's a positive feedback loop. And that means that we have um, going faster and faster. It doesn't mean positive effects. It means faster and faster. There are reasons for that that I'd be happy to explain later if anybody's interested. But what you can see is this isn't just weather. This isn't some momentary aberration of, oh, there isn't much ice this year. This is a relentless decline. There are some oscillations in it as it's relentlessly going downward, but it's relentless decline. And so, yeah, <laughs> this isn't good. So that's the story. And that it, itself, it's an outcome of climate change. It's an outcome of global warming, that the ice is melting faster. And then the oceans get warmer, helping to melt from underneath. You know, there's all kinds of interplay. This is an outcome. But because the ice has melted faster, we are accelerating global temperature rise. And so a couple of, so here's from 1984, January 1984 versus January 2019. You can see the before and after pictures of this horror, really. And a couple of the world's ice experts, which I am really happy to say, you know, I get to talk with these guys a lot. It's one of the great privileges of taking on what I've taken on. Um, Peter Wadhams over at University of Cambridge in the UK uh, has said in his beautiful book, A Farewell to Ice, 
the overall change in ice snow albedo in the Arctic could add as much as 50% to the direct global heating effect of CO2. That means as fast as we're accelerating temperature rise with the CO2 with our having unintentionally engineered our atmosphere, we've added another half again as much to the rate at which things are happening from the loss of reflectivity in the Arctic. That is a huge accelerant. And that's actually why I decided to take this on as maybe the key lever that ironically, right, in great challenges or great opportunities, if we can reverse that, if we can rebuild Arctic ice reflectivity, we could give ourselves some time. That's what the modeling seems to indicate. And it's a very encouraging thing. A little more time to make the urgently needed transition to sustainable fuels and sustainable energy. Um, another wonderful Arctic ice expert, this one in this country at Dartmouth, uh, Don Perovich, he's an AGU fellow. He's, he's just an incredible expert as well. Um, said, and he gives the annual report card at the AGU uh, fall meeting on what NOAA has said about ice loss. And a couple of years ago, he was saying back in March of 1985, old ice comprised about 30% of Arctic sea ice cover. Not all of it, but a lot of it, right? And now it's about 1%. That was a couple of years ago. So it's, it's just been this horrible accelerating decline. And that's a big deal. Um, when I looked at my love of inventing and my kids, I'll give you a little bit of the backstory. I couldn't run away from this. And I couldn't run away from some powerful words that had been taught to me by a mentor, Barb Waugh, at Hewlett Packard Labs. And it was the, I mean, it's old words, but they're just wonderful. Once they get in your soul, your, your life will change. And it was, if not me, who? If not now, when? And when you think about those words about caring and responsibility, it set me on this new path of invention. I do love to invent. I love to solve problems. And I'm up to only 60 uh, patents issued so far, but there are some more in the way. But it set me on this path of invention and problem solving for climate. But of course, I thought, I think as anybody would, I'm just one of billions of people. How could I possibly make any difference? But I looked at my skills and I looked at the, which is, I love problem solving and the great education I'd been fortunate enough to have. I mean, MIT, Berkeley, you know, how, how does it get any better really? And I thought, well, why not me? Why not give it a try? And I'd recently added a part-time gig at Stanford as a consulting professor. So I had the chance to feel, you know, just welcome to attend any short courses and lectures that could help me learn about climate change. And I had the good fortune to talk with Steve Schneider and Terry Root, two I mean, just incredible climate scientists, and see what I got to take a short course from them one summer, a week long class. And I got to see whether they thought what I was proposing to do to save Arctic ice made any sense at all. And they said it did. And as it turns out, ice loss, as we've seen in the intervening years, really, really matters. So I find that a nonprofit to save Arctic ice and restore its reflectivity, because with all the ice that's melted in the Arctic, we've lost most of the world's historic Arctic heat shield. And that loss, as I said, is adding up to 50% to the rate of global warming. And what this does is it makes for climate instabilities and risks much, much more dangerous. We've destabilized basically the historic patterns of the jet stream. We've added it, the intensity and frequency of these storms. Um, and you, you know, you can see it in the headlines. And this is going much faster than from greenhouse gases alone. Of course, it's tempting to do nothing, right? I mean, that's always the temptation. Well, maybe, maybe it'll just get better somehow. But the costs of doing nothing are absolutely staggering in financial and human terms, ecosystem terms. In just one year in the US, this chart is showing, I believe this is a NOAA chart as well. Uh, it's showing that these impacts are becoming, well, in one year in the US, sorry, I read ahead of myself. In 2018, the climate impacts cost almost $100 billion. One country, one year, almost $100 billion. And the impacts are getting worse, as you've seen in your daily headlines over time. So now picture what that means. That means potentially billions of climate refugees, billions of them, fleeing conditions of drought, flood, failed crops, hurricanes, sea level rise, and here in California, fire, not to mention species extinction and ecosystem losses. 
And I asked myself if this was a world I wanted for my children, and the answer was absolutely not. There has to be something better. Now, of course, when you take on something like this, you've heard I'm a, I'm a PhD engineer. I, I love to solve technical problems, but what do I know about the rest of it? And it's been really intriguing and rewarding to be considering the framework. You know, what is it that we actually need to consider? We need to consider all the stakeholders. And my colleague at Arctic Ice Project, Dan Danielle Chamberlain, put this together in jigsaw puzzle format, which I, I really love. So she looked at, you know, who the stakeholders we've been talking about are, and she just put it together this way. Okay, academic institutions, you need the scientists to agree or, or help you understand the native peoples, the people who actually live in the Arctic are, you know, very largely indigenous uh, First Nations populations. You want to make sure what you're doing is right for them. Government labs, scientific organizations can help. We need policymakers. We need people to help make the framework for what's going to be in the best interest of humanity in an impartial way. Don't ask the inventor. You know what my answer is going to be. You want to have somebody impartial look at that. Early stage research, very important. Lab testing, deployment research, climate modeling, we're doing all of that and it all matters. Effectiveness in the field, I like to call that ice truthing rather than ground truthing. Ecotoxin fate studies of the materials, make sure they'll do no harm. And adoption is the prize. If we can get all of these parameters answered and satisfied to everybody's satisfaction, which is a mighty task. There really isn't an institution set up yet to really make those judgments, but I think it's what we need. And so here it is written a little bit larger if you were having trouble reading the smaller version. So we needed to consider, you know, first, look beyond just the technology, first do no harm. That is, this is one thing Steve Schneider taught me early on, and that was so good. That is, don't make things worse for Pete's sake, whatever you try. That's the basic thing you have to do is make sure you're not making anything worse. And we needed to consider the entire framework of what would be required that will be of net benefit to humanity. And there are all these stakeholders we talked about, including indigenous populations, local residents, our ecosystems, our fellow species, and the humans still to come and our kids who are still growing up, right? And many on this list, of course, have no present voice. I really love the book, The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson, where he factors in the future generations as part of the ecosystem challenge. He's, he's so right, they don't have a present voice. But when you think about climate intervention, repair, restoration, it goes by many names, we have a responsible re regeneration. We have a responsibility to all. And all of this means that we've got to collaborate. I love the title of this talk. I think Pamela chose it for us and it's, it's perfect. Um, we need to collaborate with many people in groups of many different skill sets to develop and independently assess all those needed aspects to be sure we're proposing a viable and beneficial solution. So our goal is, as Pamela said, to make time to make the transition to sustainable fuels and energy solutions because turning over the world's infrastructure will take time. This is one thing I learned at Stanford's annual GSET meetings, Global Climate and Energy Project, just how long it was gonna take for infrastructure to turn over for solar adoption. It's gone faster than we expected, but it's still, we're a ways off. Even once we get serious and decide to go full speed on these infrastructure transitions. So that means we need time. And that's really what I wanted to do. I reasoned that if we can preserve and hopefully rebuild Arctic ice reflectivity, that would become a big lever in the right direction to help give us a bit more time to get a handle on CO2 and complete the urgent transition to these sustainable solutions. And our teams, we have a couple of retired, very high level NASA administrators who volunteer with us. And they've estimated that our solution could give the world up to 15 years more to urgently get that transition made. And I think we'll need it, even going full speed ahead to adopt sustainable ways. So what is the solution? Well, the proposed solution is to restore ice with a thin layer of safe reflective material in limited strategic areas with first do no harm as our guiding principle. When I was looking at all of this years ago, it's like, I finally asked myself a question that I could answer, or at least look for the answer for it. it was, is there a safe reflective material that could replace that lost reflectivity, that lost functionality in the Arctic? 
And so that's what the project, what the work has been. Um, you can see all kinds of uh, features of the material. I'm not sure how many of you are, are technical. Uh, for those of you who are, enjoy. This, <laughs> this, this is really uh, the sort of considerations that I, I enjoy a lot and have some background in from the studying and, and uh, professional work I've had. So initially, and, and I will say very importantly, this passes all the safety tests so far. It's silica-based, silica is hydrophilic, which means it won't pick up oil-based pollutants and put them in at the bottom of the food chain. It's one of the most abundant materials on the planet. Uh, sometimes I think people are thinking, is silica a different brand name for some other kind of plastic? No, 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 it's a very different material than plastic. It's basically like your beach sand. And it looks like this, right? We have a small sample here. It's, uh, it's just this really fine talc powder beach sand like material. You might be able to see it flowing from my fingers as I do this. Very, very fine. And um, they're, they're very widely used uh, in all kinds of things. And so the material chosen really uh, matters a lot for safety, practicality, and cost. Initially, I got to work testing these just in the simplest way possible on you know, little tanks on my deck to see whether they kept things cooler, to see if they could slow down ice melt. And both of those help in preserving the ice, of course. And so the material chosen, you need to consider safety, practicality, and cost. Um, so this is our current front runner, these hollow glass microspheres. What's really important, well, there are a few things that are really important. One is that it's a commercial product made in large quantities by lots of manufacturers for use in building materials, highways, marine applications, and more. And I've even seen a thing, a, a little news blurb, that they're being a, under evaluation by the FDA as a vehicle for cancer drug delivery. So within a human to see whether, you know, we could deliver drugs that way. Of course, we all evolved with silica. It's one of the most prevalent materials on earth, in the oceans, in rocks. And these HDM materials are using another kind of leverage. They're basically a, a, a thin shell around a hollow sphere, hollow core, gas core. And that means that we're using the minimal material possible as well. So they act and look like a floating white sand and they preserve ice. And this is a very leveraged use of the material. A thin coating preserves ice through making it reflect away incoming solar energy. And we've done controlled tests in collaboration with the people who live there. Indigenous people in the Arctic, uh, there's our instrumentation volunteers, Satish, and there's one of the uh, key members of UIC Science. I think this is Charles. Uh, and drilling an ice, uh, and if people get a little bit anonymous in their jackets, drilling an ice core. I've had a bunch of trips to the Arctic now <laughs> working on this. And this is on a Minnesota pond staffed by a couple of volunteers in the Minneapolis area. And uh, you can see how bright the area that we've treated is. Uh, here in Utkyagvik in Alaska, this is on uh, so a, a small pond in the Barrow Experimental Observatory area. And then here, this is another freshwater pond in Minnesota. And instantly we brighten, we brighten the surface by putting these materials on. So after the initial tests on the deck, you know, I worked with it, the same instrumentation volunteer, Satish, on a lake in the Sierras with the water district's permission. And then over the years, have gotten to expand the work to teams in Alaska, teams in Minnesota, always working with, always very transparent with, and getting the permissions, the appropriate permissions with the indigenous local residents, any other authorities that we need. And basically, with a small amount of this safe commercial material that looks like a white floating sand, we can make the reflectivity change right away. And so that's very good. We can also help melt water. And that's nice. I've wanted something that would float so that every time if you got buried in snow and the snow melts, this rises to the top of the melt water. And that's a really useful feature as well. So in principle, this is extremely simple. But as you've been hearing, there's a lot you have to check out. Here's another way to look at this. A thin coating of this material is restoring the reflectivity on ice and on melt ponds. We have some great data this season from Minnesota that's really solid that gets to show that aspect. So open ocean doesn't reflect much. These are some of the from some of the numbers that Don Perovich, one of those experts I quoted, does. He's, he's one of the world's great ice albedo 
uh, experts. <laughs> you can tell why I would find him. Albedo means brightness. And so, um, so only about 5% of the sunlight gets fended away from the ocean. Of course, it depends some on angle, but this is sort of the average value. Young thin ice reflects more than open ocean. You saw it from the satellite imagery too. Um, but it doesn't reflect nearly as much as old ice, especially if it's got a nice coating of snow on it. Our solution is just to take a hair's width, really, of, of this sort of material, these hollow glass microspheres, very thin layer, few, few hundred micron thick, and we can boost reflectivity considerably immediately. Over time, if that preserves ice through a summer in some locations, it can start to have the potential to regrow multi-year ice, yet another leverage, which is really exciting. Um, Again, looking close up, uh, again, on the Minnesota pond, bare ice has a pretty low reflectivity. Um, snow has a great one. And that same patch of bare ice treated with hollow glass microspheres, boom. As soon as it hit there, it clings. It's hydrophilic. It wants to cling to the ice or the water. And it gets brighter. So it's, it's that simple. So as you can see, the reflectivity of the bare ice is boosted to be much more like the snow as soon as the HDMs are applied. It's a practical way to slow down and perhaps break the vicious ice albedo positive feedback loop effect that's been driving this extraordinary melt. The field testing from this just concluded season, even with the pandemic conditions fueled by our principal engineer, Alex, and our really amazing volunteers in Minnesota, Tony and Doug, has produced a wonderful data set. This is just a small sampling of it to measure how well the solution works. Here's some drone footage. Um, you always do in an experiment, a control, an untreated control, and a test area. And that's what we have here. Early in the season, right after application, and then right after the melt. You can see that the area that was treated lasted longer. We did a ice melt comparison on the Minnesota pond, and we're reducing the data that's still in progress but we got to see the slowing quantitatively of the ice loss versus no treatment. And we got to see in these compelling pictures, you know, over the course of, this means that was that day in March and this is the, that day in March. So that, that's what this little thing is showing is a time evolution of the difference in reflectivity between treated and not. You can see the melting in from the edge is so much worse in the untreated control. The test is holding on much better. It turned white here. There was the snow in the middle of the test, but the test continued. And so uh, this is really uh, nice, very nice uh, collab corroboration of what we, we know uh, now about rate of, of helping keep the ice. With this kind of work, as well as with important collaborations with experts in the areas needed, we get to study and evaluate the important aspects of how well we could preserve and rebuild ice in small strategic portions of the Arctic with this safe and inexpensive material. And the aims to see where the solution is most needed and where it could be most effective to slow the ice melt. And in some areas, rebuild bright reflective ice in a strategic and economic way. The last piece of leverage that we're looking at right now. So you've seen the comparative data in the drone footage. It's really looking like we have the real potential to use the solution on melt ponds. The preservation in the test area versus the control area got much better once the snow was gone because snow is hard to beat. Snow is terrific. If you can have snow in place, you're gonna slow down ice melt a lot. But once the snow's gone, the hollow glass microspheres do their thing. So we've got to evaluate options like ice restoration seriously and responsibly and the options for safe, natural as possible low risk climate restoration solutions. And it now appears, I started this as the backup plan I hoped we'd never need, but it now looks like the world's really gonna need this. As quickly as we can finish evaluating effectiveness, safety, areas of greatest need, funding, economics, and all kinds of practicalities. Another aspect of this work is a collaboration with expert climate modelers that this group is originally from Lawrence Livermore National Labs who are now working at Climformatics, a small business, a small but mighty business, to use the, another kind of leverage, that one of picking what are the most beneficial areas. And we flagged the Fram Strait because of all that ice export and the Beaufort Shire because it is the historic nursery of growing multi-year ice as our areas of study 
trying to figure out how big an area do we have to treat in order to have the most beneficial areas and to make the smallest but effective limited ice treatments to have the maximum benefit in the Arctic and the world. In most of the technical aspects of our work, we've been assessed at a TRL-3 level. Uh, to those of you who are technical, um, technology readiness 3 means we've demonstrated solid proof of concept in most of our technical areas, not quite all, but most. And the materials approach we've got has many other potential applications for saving ice, cooling water, several others that we've investigated. But so far, we've been primarily focused in our experimental work on saving Arctic ice, because that seems to be the most urgently needed practical and safe lever we know of to slow climate devastation. But wait, there's more. Um, because of the great results in Minnesota showing Yes, it really could work on melt ponds, and that's a big deal in glacial ice melt. And being approached by some key people in Himalayas with interest in the Himalayas and Greenland, we actually are, are looking seriously at, can glacial ice melt be slowed by these techniques? We've been wondering that for years. We've done some small tests. Greenland's melt, of course, if it all goes, we're going to have seven meters of sea level rise uh, predicted, which wipes out so many coastal communities, so many of the poorer populations of the world. It's, it's just unconscionable. Just think of all the climate refugees we'd have. If the Himalayan melt continues, we're already at risk of the water supply of 1.6 billion people. <laughs> Again, Think, think of the devastation, the horror. It's just horrible. But I will say again, all the test results say that, uh, you know, everything's safe about HGMs and they, they should work. But I am one person who's going to insist we keep test, test, testing and make sure there's no untoward effect. We do want to first do no harm. If we had to change our materials set a bit, we're Silicon Valley. We can pivot. We've got a lot of materials expertise on our team. So lately we've realized that the chances are that we could get the vital permissions, we're not gonna work without permissions, to work on land ice in Greenland and the Himalayas well before we could get those permissions to work on sea ice. We've had a key offer of help in this from a very credible source. And because the problems are so urgent and large in both those areas, we have hopes that we can expeditiously raise the funds and build the collaborations we need to get this underway ASAP. I'd certainly like to be working on a test site in Greenland before the next melt season there. Don't know if we can move quite that fast, but we're sure gonna try. As always, this work is being accelerated by help from expert volunteers, which carries on the tradition I started it with. At, at first it was my solo volunteer effort, inconvenient hobby. Uh, we're bigger now, we've got excellent and key paid staff as well as a team of incredibly effective and dedicated volunteers and repeated gifts from an excellent college, Harvey Mudd College down in Southern California where they have granted us for two years and they're offering us a third, it looks like if everything works out of students who work with us all year long, 10 hours a week in their clinic program, uh, mentored by their own staff, gifted to us at no cost to us. So that is really a wonderful advantage. Um, Pamela, I have the ability to go to a more personal note um, that will still leave enough time for some lively Q and A if you'd like. Um, Yay or nay? Well, I feel privileged to be called on to make that decision. I just want more. So if you okay. want to get more, We're I will have... wait and say more. And then everybody who's got a question, just hang on. We'll have a good question and answer session at the end. And you should be able to figure out how to reach me. If not, um, well, I bet you can find me on LinkedIn. And I bet Pamela would be willing to give my email address out if it isn't already visible. For sure. I'd be happy to pass on any emails. And then today, just you can you can um, just unmute yourself and speak up during this question session or put up your hand uh, digitally by using the little toggle thing at the bottom of your screen. So yeah, go for it. OK. Yeah, I'm kind of robbing for myself. I gave a recent TEDx talk, and if you want more on that, you know, look up that TEDx talk. But I found it's an interesting analogy. So uh, you're going to wonder why I'm talking about hiking in mountains when the talk's about climate, but I hope it'll soon become clear. It seemed to work for them. So here we go. I liken my climate work in some ways to the hike I've made up Half Dome with my husband, Phil, and the later hike up Mount Katahdin with my brother and younger son. On our way up Half Dome, there came a point when I was waiting for Phil to join me. And as I looked 
down in almost every direction, I started quaking with fear. I had conveniently forgotten while I planned that hike that I have an incredible fear of hiking. <laughs> <laughs> when it kicks in, it kicks in. Oh, Dan is here. I hear you laughing. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Poor me. Yeah. Um, I asked a hiker how he managed not to be afraid. And he told me you have to learn to use the fear. And I thought that was irritatingly mysterious. And I found myself angrily declaring to the rocks, use the fear. What on earth does that even mean? And when Phil joined me, he suddenly became the leader as he turned into Coach Phil, encouraging me not to look at the whole terrifying path, but to take each small step of the journey and just focus on that until we finally arrived at the top of that big, beautiful rock. This is my painting too. I, I really love the mountains. I learned a lot about teamwork on that day. And why do I love to hike despite the fear of heights? Because it is so beautiful. And Dana kind of asked me to sing. So you spoke up at just the right time, Dana, in the PV forum. So here goes a few seconds of music. <clears throat> I also have a recording of me. Our choir had to go remote this year, right? So I have a recording of me singing with myself as a multi-part round if you want that extra five seconds. But you might recognize this. It's a, it's a Native American song, as I understand it. And it makes a round beautifully. Sing. <clears throat> here, here goes the risk. Here we go. Now I walk in beauty, beauty is before me, beauty is behind me, above and, be and below me. And if you want the full Nelson here, we're going to try that. Am I giving you a chance to say no? Apparently not. Bravo, Leslie. Oh, thank you. It's only five seconds, so. <laughs> Different key. to sing. Um, as I say, I've got a lot of hobbies that if I had the time for them <laughs> would be very fun. Um, a few years later, we were in northern Maine on a ridiculous trail of, well, and I have to say, I think love. I think love is a lot of what gets to motivate really good work, right? It's the love of my kids. It's the love of the beauty on this planet. And that will keep you stoked in the hardest times. So there you go. A few years later, we were in northern Maine on a ridiculous trail of refrigerator-sized rocks wedged between trees on Mount Katahdin with my brother and youngest son. I, I look at this and think how laughingly they must have called this a trail. Uh, but our son blazed ahead with my blessing because he could clearly handle himself. And I encouraged my brother who lives in Maine and knows the mountain to go ahead and make sure my son got on and off the summit before the predicted thunderstorms hit later in the afternoon. As I hiked on alone, the saddle trail became a vertical rock field. So this, this wasn't bad enough. It got <laughs> just completely steep. And I'm not a rock climber. <laughs> uh, and there were vaguely painted blue dots here and there indicating the trail. And clinging to a rock partway up, I made the mistake of looking down <laughs> oh my God, to see if maybe I should go back. And that fear of heights kicked in again big time. And I'm all alone. And there I was clinging gecko-like to this rock halfway up and gosh, I'm, I'm totally terrified. I can't move. Looking, can I go down? I don't know, it's pretty steep. I'm not sure I can. Can I go up? Wouldn't that only make it worse? I don't think I can. And I finally realized holding on for dear life that I can't just stay there clinging. That's actually not an option. Eventually I'd lose my grip and go down way too fast. And so I decided to climb up so my brother and son wouldn't get trapped by the storm from waiting or looking for me. I don't know how I made it, really. I did get to the very top of Katahdin with them, but by the time we got down, it was full dark, and we had hiked through three thunderstorms in a very close encounter with a huge moose. And I think it's like doing nothing or not enough about climate change. We can't just sit here. It is not an option. 
The work is very serious, but it's often fun too. And here's a full circle moment I loved, having our younger son volunteering with me up in Utkyagvik, AKA Pharaoh, to help save his and his brother's future. And I've gotten to learn from these amazing polar experts from all around the world, as you've seen. So I have the privilege of partnering with people of incredible heart and soul and passion to work together to try to save the future for all of us, for your and my and their kids, our ecosystems, our precious, precious planet. So thanks for your kind attention. And please get in touch with me if you have questions or if you wish to help with connections, advice, volunteering, because it will take more than this one organization working alone and more than this one extraordinary village of PV alone to get this urgent work done in time to make a difference. Uh, I think we've got about 15 minutes for questions or even hang on longer if that's okay with everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Oh, I'm all yours. <laughs> Who wants to ask what? Just, you know, I have a question. Okay, <laughs> my question for you, Leslie, is have you thought about uh, so a, what a large project, a large experiment might look like? So um, like one that's like, I don't know, 10 by 10 miles or some, something that's big. What does that look like and how much does that cost? And yeah, um, how, many, how many people would need to work on it? Or what, what does something large look like? Yeah, what we've been modeling um, has been things like 100,000 square kilometers uh, in the Fram Strait. So that, that's pretty big. And the costs for that have been estimated. So that's on sea ice. And the costs for that have been estimated at, you know, the materials costs are only something like, I think it was $350 million per year. Assume maybe that you can't recapture them. Assume they're going to float off, sink, you know, whatever. Um, but the cost with all the logistics of shipping and, and partnering, I mean, it's all about partnering. Partnering with shipping, Arctic shipping companies who could do that safely, um, you know, we're thinking could be one to $5 billion a year. But that's still trivial compared to the devastation that we would be able to avert or, or slow. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things seem pretty expensive. We, we've gotten uh, some number estimates of maybe $200,000 to do a reasonable sized deployment in, in Greenland, you know, to, to start doing that. That's not too bad. Um, but I think it's all about, I, I believe what uh, our, our uh, vice chair, especially on our board says, Steve Zornitzer uh, used to be the head of all the research and development at NASA Ames. So what a wonderful volunteer to have with you, right? And it's that we as a small organization, and we are, uh, should be looking always to what are the partnerships we can use to get the job done. We're not going to be able to, we, we can't, I'm not instantly going to become an expert marine biologist or a deployment expert or an Arctic shipping expert, nor is anyone else on our current team. But if you can collaborate with people, which does take funding, um, you, can, you can get it done a lot faster and you can get it done a lot more expertly. And you've got that independent review. We have a really uh, wonderful team lined up in Norway as soon as we can get the funding to do it, um, Sintef, uh, who are a, a group of marine biologists with a lot of Arctic expertise to make sure we know what happens to the materials, these particular materials. Will we affect any phytoplankton versus zooplankton, you know, if we're, if we're putting these in. We, we know we're not going to kill anything, or we, we think we know that from all of the information out there. We don't make anything sick. But would we feed something better than another thing? And would that run into bad problems? So it's all those kinds of you know, people. I've, I've gone beyond your question, but it's just looking at you got to do collaborations to do any of this. And we've been getting as a, as a follow up question to that. So 100 square kilometers. 100,000 square, 100, square kilometers. Is that as big as the Fram Strait? Actually, the Fram Strait is, we, we've been doing our calculations in the past on 100,000. What they've actually modeled is 150,000 square kilometers, and that fills up most of the Fram Strait. The Beaufort Gyre, we're going to model a bigger, a bigger amount. And there's another collaboration. NASA, NASA Earth Exchange has been kind enough to, you know, help us with supercomputer time to be able to do that. So, but it's, uh, you know, you look at how much effect do you want to have? Uh, one thing I'm passionate about is doing localized minimal leverage interventions that you could undo or at least understand locally what's been done. 
uh, rather than some massive, you know, global thing. And so we're really looking for what can respect that the most. It seems to pose the least risks to ecosystems and such. Thank you. Uh, good questions, Bonnie. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm hoping to have a conversation. Yeah, hello, this is Tom Blyer. Can you hear me? I can. Hi, Tom. Yeah, I was wondering uh, how you physically spread this material evenly, uh, efficiently. Is this like an aircraft uh, with some kind of spray rig on it? Yeah, beautiful question. So in our tests on that Minnesota pond, we basically walked around on frozen ice with a sort of a glorified giant salt shaker uh, with, you know, you'd fill it up to a, a specified height so that in each five foot by five foot square outlined by PVC pipes, you might have noticed there was sort of rectangular brightnesses all along that pond. That's why we would step that thing forward each time. You can do that on a small area. In Utkjagvik, we've put it in a drop spreader and, and driven it behind a snow machine uh, to deploy two and a half football fields worth of material. Uh, but on the ocean, on, on any really uneven terrain, you're right, uh, aircraft are tempting. Uh, what we've looked at quite a bit, and we had our Harvey Mudd Clinic modeled that this year and is working on a paper with us on it. Uh, how could we deploy it out of a ship and park the ship you know, in the right direction for prevailing winds around a, you know, a, a large enough area of ice that's hanging on for dear life into the summer and blow the materials over that ice as evenly as you can. And that, that becomes an interesting exercise. The reason we're not just going to aircraft right away is that, you know, these are extraordinarily light materials and we're gonna fill up the aircraft hold long before we're, we're a weight problem, but it means that there's an enormous number of flights you might need if you were gonna do a very large area. There's other, there's other suggestions for deployment. When I said we're mostly at TRL-3, the proof of concept, we're not quite there on deployment yet. Part of it's been choosing what are the optimal materials. We made a lot of progress on that this year. What specifically HGM materials look the best, best reflectivity for price, for, for easy to work with vendor, for low GHG, uh, production in the manufacturing process, all that. We're, we're making big strides there. But the actual deployment of it, there's, there's a few different options out there. And uh, it's going to be a very interesting thing. Um, but I think we're going to get there. Uh, some of the marine shippers themselves, Arctic shippers, have some interesting ideas as well. Great question. Anybody else? Hi, Leslie. It's Scott Elrod. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, the 150,000 square miles, um, if, you, if you think about that area times whatever thickness, this would be 100 microns, a couple hundred microns. Um, in terms of the volume of these glass spheres, what is that volume and how does that compare to the world production of the glass microspheres um, in annual? Yeah, 150,000 square kilometers, not miles. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> And it's, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't challenge the world production. But one thing that I find very nice is that one of the vendors is, got, is in the process of bringing up a line that makes a beautiful material. It's performed really well in laboratory tests in their, from their pilot line um, that is made from recycled glass. And that would be a lovely start. It keeps the GHG you know, impact of, of making these things much lower. Uh, it, it performs extraordinarily well. And I'm eager for them to get their line up, you know, fully up so we can see what their manufacturing line quality uh, product looks like and, and what they'll really end up costing it at. But I, I don't think we're bumping up against, I mean, if one were to try to carpet the entire Arctic, I think we'd really challenge things, but we're certainly not going to want to do that. So yeah, it's, it's comfortable. You know, I deliberately chose a family of materials rather than something experimental, a family of materials that's in wide commercial use, because I had this feeling, I mean, even back 2006, 15 years ago, when I was getting this started, that by the time we decided to take action, it was probably going to be we were about to hit that cliff wall, you know, it's just just hard. And I wanted to put a cushion in there. 
And so I wanted not to have to bring up a new uh, commercial product line, you know, just as people were deciding that we should do it, which would be the only time you could, right? How could you get the money before that to do that? So I'm very happy that there's a number of vendors and a large number of applications for these types of materials out there already. Did that answer at all? Yes, it must have. Yes, yes, it did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we still got a few minutes. And Pamela, I don't know if we get to go over if people really get into passionate discussion. I'm happy to. One of my favorite subjects. Because we've got this line as long as people want to have it. Um, so it's just up to the group if you want to keep talking and keep talking, or if people feel like that's been really educational and ready to move, that's great too, however. I have a quick question. Cool. It's about politics, actually. <laughs> so I'm thinking about this Fram Strait. I'm thinking about Russians. I'm thinking about, mm -hmm. okay. Is there, are there, is there, are there interests out there of people who don't want <laughs> this to be frozen over? Absolutely. Uh, the first time I went to the Arctic Circle Assembly in Iceland, in Reykjavik, um, it was pretty darned educational. Because what many of the speakers, this is a very open conference. It's, it's deliberately open. It's run by former president of Iceland many times, uh, Olafur Ragnar Grimson. And he, oh, he's, he's a, just a geopolitical genius, really. And he wants deliberately an open, inclusive community to come and discuss all things Arctic. It's, it's what he wants. And he especially wanted the last time there was one in person. So I guess that was the second year I'd been there. He asked me to give a plenary because he wanted me to, I, I can tell he didn't say this specifically, but he, it seemed to me, he wanted me to speak up for what are the interests of the planet as a whole? What are the interests of the Arctic? Because the very first one I went to, there was a speaker who was unabashedly talking about all the opportunities with the ice melt and how much oil they could, they could drill, how much they could mine. And I found this way to think about things just completely inexplicable for a bit till I thought about it more. And I thought about it, I mean, this is, this is our home group here, so I'll, I'll let you in on what I, what I was thinking of. When you have high school kids, and they're getting ready to go off to college and you have these debates about happiness. And I, the mom, am thinking about their long-term happiness and they're thinking about their short-term happiness. And the truth is you gotta consider both. And I think that when people are, if I'm gonna give them the most credit I can possibly give somebody, when they're thinking about drilling and mining instead of the well-being of the planet as a whole, you know, I'd think differently about all this if my kids were going to starve tomorrow and that was going to be the job that would put food on the table. I'm not going to look quite as long term as to whether we're going to be doomed in a year or two. I, I'd look at it tomorrow. Can I, can I give you lunch? So I, I think that's part of it is that, but I, I certainly don't think that explains all of it. But sure, yeah, there's, there's people I'm sure who are praying that we can't do it. On the other hand, on the other hand, the infrastructure in these areas, anybody who's living in the Arctic is, have, is experiencing or at risk of experiencing this crumbling infrastructure as the permafrost under them is melting. So the buildings up in Utkagvik, up in Barrow, are on stilts because the heat just from you living in your house is going to melt the ground under you unless you build that way. And so there's, there's becoming a lot of losses that way. There's becoming these sudden meltings that you know, can wipe out a whole village and kill people, which has been happening in Greenland and Himalayas. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting situation. Let's put it that way. The politics are not simple. Um, if you have any, if any of you have any terrific political connections, uh, <laughs> we would love to to be able to try, there's groups of people I'm connected with who are writing letters to various people for the G20 and for the COP26 to just say, please fund, you know, we're not the only climate restoration solution out there, you know, trying to, we're, we're working on the Arctic and it looks like we're the farthest ahead. 
effort in that area and it look, looks like that's darned important but there are all these others that need to be funded as well you know kelp restoration mangrove forest regenerative agriculture the list goes on as part of what i love about uh, teaching that stanford class because i get to see i get to see all these hopeful solutions but they all need funding uh, the what's getting funded right now seems for these sorts of things seems to come entirely from philanthropy which is wonderful. Thank you, thank you, philanthropists. But what we hear is only 3% of philanthropic money goes towards climate. So it's, if there were you know, ways to get into the actual official US budget and other international budgets to, to fund this work, that would be the right and stable way to go. Longer term ask though. Thanks Leslie, that was great. Cool, thank you. Okay, anybody else? I could threaten to sing again if you don't ask more questions. <laughs> okay, well, we're right at 831, so yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. It's so important to have a little hope, right? So thank you for that, invaluable. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Oh, thanks, Raleigh. Yeah, I, I think of it as I've been working on this, you know, staring into the fiery pits of hell for over a decade. And how on earth can you- Leslie? Yes? Can you hear me? It's Lori. I just finally figured out how to get my um, microphone to work. I just wanted to tell you, you are doing amazing, amazing work. And I'm so proud of you and your whole team just watching you over more than 10 years. <laughs> And seeing what you've we've gotten to, I'm just so impressed and so pleased. Keep up the good work. Oh, Lori, thank you. Oh, that's that means a lot. Thank you. Good job, Les, Dana. Yep, good job. Okay, signing off. Thank you all. Yeah, this has been a, a pleasure. Wonderful. Really wonderful. <laughs>